I've often quoted as saying I would rather be governed by the first 2,000 people in the Boston Telephone Directory than by the 2,000 people on the faculty of Harvard University. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. They share our beliefs, our convictions, our hopes, and our dreams. These are the conservatives of the heart. They are our people. Join the best in the movement. It's Conservative Conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Marlo, Johnny, and Nate. We hope you had a restful Christmas and New Year's, and we're excited to introduce our first episode recording for 2022 with Erica Bakayaki, who is a legal scholar and the author of the book, The Rights of Women, which is among several other books that were nominated for ISI's Conservative Book of the Year Award. Thanks for joining us, Erica. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be with you. So Erica is going to talk with us about her book today. But before that, we'll get started with a listener question from Liz, who wants to know how Erica would classify the current feminist movement and whether or not you would assign it a wave. And if so, which one? It's in shambles. (laughs) And that's a good thing for those of (laughs) us who uh, think it needs to go. The way, you know, I tend not to speak so much in waves. Um, I think others do this. I, you know, in my own book, I kind of talk about the first and second wave and then sort of let that terminology go. I tend to think about uh, the movement today. I mean, obviously, there's kind of postmodern aspects of it. Um, There's existentialist aspects of it. Um, The the thing that I really focus on that I think is quite harmful is really the market uh, sort of centric focus, sort of the the need for like a market equality, uh, which kind of dominates their rhetoric about equality. And I think that's really, so I want to call it like a kind of a, you know, a neoliberal uh, feminism um, is, is probably the part that I think it's most harmful for uh, dis- especially disadvantaged women today. Um, but there are lots of harms uh, to today's <laughs> feminism. I'm glad you touched on that because one of the questions we'll ask later is about um, class implications and how, you know, feminism has evolved with uh, changing, I guess, you know, class disparity and how feminists kind of, uh, how the feminist movement perhaps can change to account for that, has it changed to account for that? And um, do you think, and whether you think that those class disparities have informed a lot of thinking today or in the future about feminism? So that's a great question from Liz. And our next question for you, Erica, is which books have you read that ignited your interest in the questions you tackle in this book? So, uh, you know, primarily on feminism and you can even walk us through when that interest started. Yeah. So the interest actually goes quite a bit back. I I sort of, um, you know, mentioned this in passing in the book, but I talked a lot more about it in other places on podcasts and other writing I've done just about the fact that, um, I was a women's studies student um, and in the uh, mid-1990s at the very liberal college, Middlebury College in Vermont. Um, One summer, I actually even worked for Bernie Sanders. So I considered myself like a socialist feminist, Um, came from a really uh, broken home. So my mom was actually married and divorced three times, kind of considered myself a jock in high school. But then when I got to college, um, I sort of had, had had a lot of kind of trauma in my life. Um, I'd had two friends take their own lives, had the three divorces, and so kind of nestled myself into the women's the women's center there on campus and started taking women's studies courses and hadn't really thought of myself as a feminist before then, but really landed hard into kind of feminism and let it really kind of take me over for a good two years of college. Um, and what happened, well, there are lots of things that happened, um, but I went down to D.C., um, and you all may uh, uh, relate to this more than others I talked to, but instead of going abroad for my junior year, I went to Washington, D.C. and um, to American University. I don't know if they still have it, but they had something called Washington Semester. And I interned with a small think tank that was assisting um, state legislatures actually in their efforts to reform welfare during the Clinton years, during kind of the Republican Revolution with um, Newt Gingrich and uh, those Clinton years where they were kind of hashing things out over welfare reform. It was a very exciting time to be down there, but I went down as a pretty uh, rabid, pro-choice, um, you know, radical feminist, um, socialist feminist. So a lot of different things happened during that time. Part of it was just literally working on welfare reform. But the really fundamental thing that happened was reading several books that my professor at American University um, assigned to me from within the communitarian movement. 
that was really um, taking shape right then in the 1990s. And that was really influential over me. The most prominent book that I read that had the most and the deepest and the longest influence was by Marianne Glendon, uh, the book Rights Talk, which earned her quite a bit of acclaim at that time. Um, she was um, had been known by then as uh, a comparatist. So she was a Harvard Law professor, was then, I think, still... Um, actually, she had gone to Harvard by then, but she had been at Boston College before then. But she was one who had this great capacity to um, kind of tell the story of political theory while also talking to us about the law. And um, her comparatist expertise in understanding both the American political tradition um, has a great affection for the American founding, but then also understanding sort of uh, the European civil law tradition um, it really kind of racked me. And um, I fell in love <laughs> with both the book, but then also was studying alongside it um, constitutional law. And so all of this kind of um, started to help me think more broadly about political theory. Um, it pushed me to question actually my pro-choice views, even though Marianne is uh, a leading pro-life thinker. The book is not explicitly pro-life. But she got me to start thinking about kind of autonomy as the central kind of fee key feature, which is very prominent, of course, among feminists. And when I got back to Middlebury College, having read Wright's talk, I fell into the hands of the students of Leo Strauss, who were teaching at Middlebury, uh, most prominently Murray Dry, Paul Nelson, um, with whom I started studying ancient philosophy. And so it was really Marianne's work, I think, in that semester itself. And the books I read, Michael Sandel and Emmetti Azioni, I read that semester who started me kind of on the process of, you know, like Strauss and his students, kind of going back to the ancients and seeing how they could, <clears throat> if they had anything true to say, really, and how they could kind of inform our thoughts. So that, you know, for a while, I was kind of, um, it took me a while to sort all this out with my feminist friends. And for a while, I kind of just... Um, left, I would say, the feminist movement entirely. I mean, I was really struck by all of this, had become a bit more conservative economically as well through sort of, you know, rubbing shoulders with people working on welfare reform. Um, but it was really, uh, um, you know, then um, starting to think about women's issues again later in um, life, maybe, you know, five, 10 years later, where I started to see that that all that study I'd done in feminist theory ahead of time could really be of use in thinking about kind of what's wrong with feminism today and really what, you know, what's right, what's, what's um, good uh, and what can be kind of culled out of the great tradition of, of the women's rights movement. It's interesting. Um, you mentioned kind of starting out from this uh, position of embracing feminist uh, logic because we had Mary Harrington on several months ago who I read actually er, kind of a review of, her of your book um, on Unheard by Her. And she kind of has like a similar trajectory, which is very interesting to see. Yeah, she and I have become good friends. It's quite fun. <laughs> She's brilliant. <laughs> Thanks for that thoughtful response, Erica. Before we dive a little bit deeper, uh, just want to say a brief word about this podcast and thank everyone for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Our mission at ISI is to educate for liberty. If you'd like help, if you'd like to help us in pursuing that mission, please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more listeners like yourself. So, Erica, the title of your book to start your interview is, uh, or to start this conversation, is uh, "The Rights of Women: Reclaiming a Lost Vision." So, it's obviously eye-catching given the contemporary political landscape. Could you just start us off by describing to our listeners what the thrust of your book is? Sure. So The Rights of Women is really an intellectual history, <clears throat> really, of the cause of women's rights, um, starting with the normative moral and political theory of uh, the <clears throat> 18th century British philosopher Mary Wollstonecraft, whose kind of thought I then trace through, you could say, if you want to use that terminology, the first wave of the women's movement, um, which people generally think of as suffrage, though I complicate that to talk about property ownership um, and some other important things, Seneca Falls, et cetera. Um, and then up through the Industrial Revolution, which I really take to be a kind of a key, um, a key moment. Um, and then up through Betty Friedan's work, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, and then um, culminating with the work of Marianne Glendon, who I 
really argue is, uh, I think the true completion, I guess you would, you could say of Mary Wollstonecraft's thought. That's obviously a very contentious, <laughs> controversial argument I'm making, but I basically show that there are these two strains of women's rights, um, kind of activism or the philosophical, um, kind of impetus or underlying arguments for rights. And one comes out of Wollstonecraft, which of course we'll talk about, and I think leads, you know, through a bunch of different thinkers um, through that time, Florence Kelly, Frances Willard, parts of, uh, um, uh, you know, Betty Friedan, parts of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but then really finds its full flourishing in, in um, Glendon. The other line that is kind of in competition is that of really the, the modern um, thinkers, especially John Locke, but also John Stuart Mill, who, of course, wrote The Subjection of Women. And that book tended to be of influence on someone like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who I take to be kind of the first of this um, train, but then all the way through uh, into the, the second wave of the 1970s feminist movement with a special, um, especially uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who actually quoted Mill quite a bit. Um, and so I really kind of show how we could have gone either way. And we really, you know, started with Wollstonecraft, made some uh, good progress with her vision um, in the early women's rights uh, movement, but then kind of went off the cliff when we got when we got to Mill for all the reasons that liberalism itself has some difficulty kind of sustaining itself. I think one of the interesting dividing lines that I'd love to hear your thoughts about um, between, you know, most of the people who went through the education system know of key players in women's suffrage movements, um, you know, like bell hooks and the, the sort of contemporary feminists that we think of as predominant in feminist and gender studies classrooms today. Um, you talked about Wollstonecraft. You know, I, I've read uh, a little bit about feminism, the, the sort of kinds of feminism that have largely been left out of the modern fem uh, feminist narrative today. Um, and it seems like one of the distinctions is that uh, folks like Wollstonecraft were interested in, in advocating for women and the interests of women as women, whereas the more radical strains of feminism um, that are, I think, unfortunately, the predominant strains today are trying to basically erase women's womanhood and uh, in some cases, try to make them identical to men. Do you is, do you think that's an interesting or a worthwhile distinction to make? Or how would you think about the dividing line between the two camps or the two schools of thought in this regard? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of divisions. Um, one having to do with equality, sort of how equality is understood. Another very much having to do with how freedom is understood. I think you're very, I think you're right. And I would just complicate it a bit. So the kind of sameness difference divide um, was something that 1980s feminists, for instance, kind of feminist theorists took very seriously. And you had kind of those that lined up along the strict equality sameness camp and really did want to, um, and you see this kind of all going all the way back. And you're right, you do see this absolutely in Mill um, in kind of that idea of strict equality, which he talks about at the very start of his treaties. And you see this in Elizabeth Cady Stanton as well. Um, and it kind of goes to, how they understand freedom as well, which we can get into. And then you have the different strand, um, which I think you're right. I mean, one of the key things is that there's an understanding of, say, in Stanton, women as individuals, first and foremost, and then in these kind of difference theories, women's as, say, members of families, mothers, um, kind of in relationship with others. I guess the way that I would complicate that is just talking about asymmetry, which I think is a really clarifying term. Because there's not just, um, and, I, and I'd want to complicate it further by talking about how Wollstonecraft does this. So let me just kind of step back and say, there is a way in which, and it's a very important thing that Wollstonecraft does in terms of talking about the commonality between men and women. And that is in their, rash, their, their, um, their status as rational creatures, because she's actually up and against Rousseau who very much sees men and women as different, in, in fact, almost entirely different species, um, because men are really kind of rational and women are feeling creatures meant to just exist to please men. And so what Wollstonecraft wants to do is say, hold on a second, women are rational creatures made in God's image. And as such, they are responsible to live according to their end, because there are certain kinds of creatures, creatures who are um, basically called to live lives of virtue. And so they, just like men, um, 
you know, need to live the whole panoply of virtues, not just basically chastity and modesty, which is what Rousseau and, and others of her time thought. And so there is a way in which men and women are the same, and that is in their rational capacity. And they are equal, as all human beings are equal, rich, poor, um, man, woman, black, white. I mean, these are kind of the things that she talked about because of that rational capacity um, to engage in moral formation and moral development, and then also intellectual formation, and intellectual development. So that's the way in which they're the same. But of course, there's this great asymmetry between men and women, and that is in their reproductive capacity. So it's not just that they're different, um, but there, there's really important ways in which there's an inequality when it comes to sex. And it's something Aristotle got a long time ago because, you know, women reproduce inside themselves and men reproduce outside of themselves. And so when men and women have sex, they're engaging in the same act, but men can very easily, if they're callous and irresponsible, walk away from consequences of sex, whereas women are left to care for nine months, assuming she, you know, gets pregnant and then um, engage in early child care and all of that. So there's, so I think the, the, the key is not just sameness and difference, but the way in which asymmetry um, really both burdens and privileges women with caregiving. And I think that's something Wilson Craft really, really got and that Marion Glennon gets and that a lot of the women, as you say, going up through that I, you know, say kind of are on the Wilson Craft side get. Whereas the Millian side does tend to want to reduce that kind of asymmetry, try to kind of answer it in some way. And that's where, of course, we'll get to this later, I'm sure. That's where, of course, contraception and abortion become the kind of way to cure asymmetry in the 1970s feminist movement. A very different approach was taken by the earlier women's rights advocates to asymmetry. Erica, I think this is a, a natural transition to that abortion issue that you mentioned. We're, we're several weeks, uh, weeks away from the March for Life. Of course, there's a big Supreme Court case uh, decision coming up uh, this June uh, relating to abortion. So maybe could you talk a little bit about how the early founders of the feminist movement viewed abortion, uh, when things began to change, and perhaps what is lost today by the absolute, you know, the absolutist uh, defense of abortion that's mounted by the feminists. Yeah, it's kind of amazing when you go back. I mean, you know, Feminists for Life has been around for a long time. Uh, you know, they've been kind of talking about um, the early women's rights, you know, uh, uh, movement being um, pro-life and all that. And I think one of the things that my book, book does is it certainly doesn't spend all of its time on that, but it does kind of contextualize that history and brings up some sort of really choice <laughs> um, <clears throat> women um, to kind of stand as kind of flagship models, not only of the pro-life stance that these early women's rights advocates had, um, but also to contextualize it in their full philosophical understanding, which again, I believe comes, you know, in part from Wollstonecraft. Obviously, there were other influences as well. Um, one of the people I um, mentioned most prominently is Victoria Woodhill. And I do that because, um, you know, she was the first woman to run for president. Um, she was a really outspoken advocate of constitutional equality for women, the first woman to testify before Congress. But she was also really a radical. She wasn't a Christian herself. Uh, she called herself a free love advocate. It's hard in too many words to explain. It's not kind of like a 1970s free love advocate, but she wasn't in favor of marriage. Let's just say that. Um, and I just want to, I think it's helpful for listeners who you know haven't read the book yet um, to kind of get a glimpse into the kind of how she talks about the rights of the unborn. And then um, to kind of step back and think about like why the, this was also important to them. Because it wasn't just about, you know, by then we knew um, scientifically uh, that, you know, sex created a child and that child <laughs> um, was growing in the, in the womb of a mother from a, from, you know, very young age. We, at that point had, you know, microscopes, um, we, we understood about, um, fertilization. And so this is not, you know, we've grown a lot in understanding because of ultrasound, but we've known a lot for a long time. So let me just quote Woodhill. One of the things she says, so she was a champion of the rights of children. She says, rights, quote, which begin while yet they remain the fetus. So in 1970, she says, many women who would be shocked, sorry, in 1870, make sure I get that right. She says, many women who would be shocked at the very thought of killing their children after birth deliberately destroy them previously. If there's any difference in the actual crime, we should be glad to have those who practice the latter pointed out. 
The truth of the matter is that it is just as much a murder to destroy life in its embryonic condition as it is to destroy it after the fully developed form is attained, for it is the self-same life that is taken. So remember, so that's 1870. This is two years after uh, the ratification of the 14th Amendment, in which we find, you know, um, <clears throat> the need to protect um, all, uh, you know, persons equally. Um, and I think that that's important to re realize that they very much regarded the unborn as human beings, um, very much worthy of the state's protection. And so doctors um, were at that point passing laws to restrict abortion uh, to conception in, 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 most, in most places. Um, and these women's rights advocates didn't stand in their way, for sure. But the women's rights advocates had a broader understanding of why contraception and, sorry, abortion and contraception as well would be harmful to women. And that is because of this, the way in which they would, it would separate uh, um, sex from reproduction. And so therefore free men to engage in basically libidinous, like lustful behavior, which wouldn't allow them to kind of grow in the self-mastery needed to um, kind of, you know, be in good, uh, you know, collaborative relationships with their wives. It, they could engage potentially in prostitution, promiscuity, infidelities, and even marital rape. And so they really saw this as a real affront to women as well. Um, and so they worked for all sorts of things. Not only did they not stand in the way of these laws that were being passed, but they wanted to really help women. Um, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, again, one of the more radical, um, you know, really understood that that this crime of abortion would be undone by the enfranchisement of women. They really coupled women's um, elevation, women's suffrage, um, with seeing um, those women who were in desperate situations and found themselves needing to abort, that their lives would be bettered by education and franchisement, and they wouldn't feel that kind of desperation anymore. Obviously, this is all very much turned on its head um, when we come to the 1970s, and it's thought that in order to be equal to men, uh, women must have this right to engage in the killing of their own their own ch children. Um, so very much uh, in incredibly different view of equality. Um, than, than the earlier women's rights advocates. Let me just kind of put a fine point on it, and that is that you can, you can see the equality between men and women in two different ways, right? You can kind of raise or lower <laughs> women down to men and say, look, men are engaging in lust and being irresponsible, therefore let women do the same, and then you know, find that they need to uh, take the lives of their children in order to kind of be equal in this degrading way. Or you can say, which is what the earliest women's rights advocate said, let's raise men up to engage in kind of a reciprocity and collaboration um, with women. And you see this actually in a statement of Seneca Falls, which is kind of amazing, um, where uh, women, you know, basically call on uh, men. Let me just read the resolution and then I'll stop. Quote, the same amount of virtue, delicacy, and refinement of behavior that is required of women in the social state should also be required of man, and the same transgression should be visited with equal severity on both man and woman. So the way they deal with the, you know, that kind of the double standard, the perennial double standard that afflicts, um, you know, the sexual relationship between men and women is to basically hold men and women to a single, a very high moral standard. Erica, just a very quick follow-up question, something Mary Harrington pointed out that ties into what you just said was that after abortion was made legal, that out of wedlock births actually increased, um, you know, I, at least in America. Have you found evidence um, to back that up uh, as well? Yeah. So that's actually, um, I get into that a lot in my chapter where I start with um, Margaret Sanger and then get, get right into the abortion um, question. Basically it's sort of not a quick answer, um, but what you have uh, with, um, first, the pill is this kind of understanding that we can control women, that we can finally control reproduction. But what happens is that there's this increase in sexual risk taking, what you know economists call kind of a moral hazard that accompanies this. And so, because people think that they can, you know, take more risks and not have to kind of abide by this, you know, self mastery in sex, which always had been the case prior to this, they do take those risks. And so, there are more out of wedlock uh, births. And therefore, there's this new clamoring for abortion. Of course, Margaret Sanger was trying to use the pill as a prophylactic against abortion. 
but then you see um, this, you know, the incidence of abortion rise. But then as abortion then comes to be, um, you know, it's what ends up happening is this strange, very ironic twist where, you know, um, because abortion is now a backup to contraception, people tend to use contraception less frequently. And so you actually see more and more <laughs> out of wedlock childbearing, more and more unintended pregnancy because abortion is this backup and people don't need to use contraception as much. And this is, it's really fascinating. I mean, Alan Gottmacher, so after Margaret Sanger um, was the president of Planned Parenthood. So again, this is when the institution, this is like 1968, when the institution is still a pro-contraception, anti-abortion outfit. He says, when, abor when an abortion is easily obtainable, contraception is neither actively nor diligently used. And so he understood that, that if you allow abortion to be as easily obtainable as it became in 1973 with Roe v. Wade, um, people aren't going to, you know, use contraception as much. Um, and so you're going to see, yes, this sharp rise in um, unintended pregnancies and then out of wedlock childbearing, because of course, not every woman is willing to, to, you know, abort their children. But a lot of men at this point, when abortion kind of signals to them that sex does not come with the responsibility of fatherhood, they'll then um, be very happy to walk away from women and leave them to raise their children alone. So Erica, how do we apply the insights of these sort of lost thinkers of the feminist tradition to a post-sexual revolution West? Because I think that's one of the challenges for a lot of us, particularly those of us who are social conservatives, um, in our current cultural condition is, you know, the, the fight against abortion might actually be won. There's a, there's a chance that pro-lifers actually are on the winning side of that one. But I don't think the fight against contraception, you know, that one seems to be one that's been definitively lost or certainly one that um, is not going to be reversed anytime soon. And certainly insofar as sort of traditional sexual norms were uh, institutionalized by uh, sort of Christian observance and religious observance more broadly, that's something that we've lost as well. So it, the sexual revolution, to a certain extent, I think is here to stay. Uh, some of the more poisonous aspects of it, I think, can be sort of, at the edges can be reformed or reversed. But the the insights of the feminist thinkers that you're talking about and writing about are permanent, right? They're, they're really about the human condition and about uh, the relationship between men and women um, in, in a way that transcends time and, and culture to an extent. At, but they were opposing things like contraception, which for us, I think, is just not possible. So how do we take what they were writing about in the current sort of broken culture that, that we're inhabiting and use it uh, in a way that's beneficial to, to women and, and, and men and, and society writ large? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that there's a way in which, you know, there are very few people who would be out there, and I'm not one of them, who would say that, you know, we should somehow make contraception illegal. Um, I think that that would be, you know, a, a silly place to go at this point. I do think the point that Alan Gottmacher makes is a really important one, though, that, um, and it's one that I make quite a bit when I'm um, kind of, you know, thinking about um, how to, how to uh, you know, um, uh, limit the abortion license. Um, and that is that, you know, when abortion is easily accessible, contraception is not readily used. So if you're a person who thinks that contraception is going to lower the abortion rate, which there are many kind of good, well-intentioned liberals who think so, then the answer to them is to say, great, limit abortion. So people actually use their contraception better. Um, but in terms of, yeah, I mean, overturning Roe, yes, uh, you know, could be uh, coming to us this summer. <clears throat> and, um, you know, the fight for trying to use, say, something like, you know, if we were able to get enough pro-lifers in Congress to um, really see, uh, you know, human beings in the womb as having kind of equal worth through um, Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, um, I think all of those things are possibilities. I mean, I think really, you know, trying to outlaw or severely restrict pornography, I'm not really sure how that's done. I don't understand how the internet works. <laughs> um, I think all those things are important. But as you say, um, the genie is out of the bottle, you know, the toothpaste is out of the tube. So what can we do um, apart from that? I think that there is a way in which when you restrict abortion itself, when you limit pornography itself, um, uh, there are ways in which you um, can start to reset the ways people think about sex. Because if abortion is not readily available, there has to be a way in which people think again about what it is that they're engaging in. Um, and so in that way, the law, of course, is an educator. 
Um, but I think, you know, the we've, you know, in our culture, there's so many places in which we understand self-mastery and self-discipline as being the means toward freedom and happiness. And so we see this with great athletes. We see this with um, great musicians, those who are fluid in many languages. They don't just, you know, engage in those acts willy nilly, pounding on, you know, uh, um, a piano or just running out with a soccer ball and thinking they can do all sorts. You know, it takes massive amounts of discipline to do that in order to then be free. And so I think in the same way, there's um, a way in which we can talk about self mastery um, in our sexual appetites. You know, um, and, and and that's hard because sex is a really pleasurable thing. It's potentially, you know, for most people more pleasurable than even eating a lovely meal, <laughs> eating a delicious meal. And so, you know, if you want to talk about self-mastery in terms of, um, of, uh, of, you know, eating, we all, so that you don't gain weight, you don't, um, uh, you know, you're not unhealthy. We also can talk about self, sexual self-mastery. And I think because of asymmetry, um, that that's the best thing for women. And so are women going to kind of get on this bandwagon? Um, I think there are a lot of people who are beginning to think that the casual sex culture is not a good one for women. Um, there are many who are wondering, you know, what is there out there for them? And so, you know, I want to sort of set this up, um, set kind of these insights about sexual self-mastery and how it is, uh, you know, the best thing for relationships between men and women up as a real beautiful alternative um, to the casual sex um, culture that has really, I think, left a lot of women raw. And someone like Mary Harrington is a good example. Um, other, a friend of, a mutual friend of ours, Louise Brown, who's writing a book on uh, the case against the sexual revolution for polity. Um, many others who are kind of coming away um, from having lived in the sexual revolution, um, been really bitten by it and and want to find another way. So a lot, lots of us are talking, um, you know, wanting to inspire kind of a a new, um, a new kind of revolution for women that doesn't rely on on the sexual revolution of the 1970s. And I think there's a lot, uh, the, a lot of wisdom here that can be taken, as you say, from from our predecessors. On the note of uh, sexual appetites and pornography, um, and this is pornography specifically, I've I've covered it and, and written about it quite a bit because I'm I'm really interested in the the shift that I've at least seen. So I'm interested in seeing what your thoughts on this are. Um, in the past two or so years, where there seems to be a slight attitude change towards the porn industry. Um, and honestly, I think I draw it all back to, or I trace it all back to, um, partially at least, to uh, Nicholas Kristof's piece in the New York Times from, I think, 2020 um, on the, you know, the the victims of the porn industry, which were largely young women. And so it showed how the industry exploits these young women. And of course, I, I don't want to discredit the work of advocates that have been supporting these victims all along the way. But um, this wasn't the first report on the matter by any means. And uh, there was some significant movement from credit card companies in reaction um, to that piece who cut ties with Pornhub specifically after uh, a review showed, you know, the expected presence of illegal content um, on porn sites. So do you predict any type of cultural shift on the issue of porn or one within feminism and its approach to the porn industry? Um it just seems like an emphasis on class disparity within social justice movements might influence this. So curious how that might fit into um, feminist thinking or perhaps your thinking about um, your prediction about how pornography will be viewed. Yeah. So my, I wonder here, uh, not to bring up another really <laughs> controversial thing, but I wonder if <clears throat> there's going to be kind of a domino effect that happens when some of these, you know, teenagers who are transitioning, especially you know, girls, um, you know, going under uh, surgery for double mastectomies. Um, I wonder if those kind of lawsuits that I'm sure are going to happen, we saw one in Britain recently, will start to kind of uncover the way in which pornography is really at the heart, I think, of a lot of the transgender movement um, in the sense that, um, you know, if you read, if you listen to Benjamin Boyce much, who has done a ton of, I'm sure you have um, looked at his, uh, been on, you know, his YouTube channel where he's kind of done a lot of talking to those who have detransitioned, um, that pornography was really um, very much a part of both, you know, those who, those are men identifying um, as women, but then also the experience of young women 
who wanted to kind of flee womenhood because of the object objectification of women. And so I, I just kind of wonder if there's a way in which a lot of those sort of harrowing stories will come out and we'll start to see that because of how active young people are on the internet, that they are just being flooded with these horrible, horrible images that are not only, you know, reshaping the brain, making them, you know, incapable of, of taking part in, in, um, you know, beautiful life-giving um, relationships, but also, you know, causing them to really hate themselves, hate their own bodies, ha hate their own sex and their own sexuality. Um, I just, I wonder if those two things won't um, kind of happen at once. Uh, it feels like it's a train running fast. I kind of hope it hits the wall soon because the destruction is really quite, you know, awful. Um, I know I have, uh, I have, you know, several children, a couple of whom are teenage boys. And I mean, it is really um, kind of, they take it upon themselves. One of my sons has said, it is my goal in life <laughs> to never see a pornographic image. You know, whether he'll attain that goal or not, <laughs> hopefully by the grace of God would be kind of amazing. But I think um, there are those who understand how, you know, kind of traumatic it is uh, for young men and young women to see these kinds of images. So you hope parents will kind of get smart to the, uh, to the understanding that this is not just kind of your grandma, your grandfather's porn, right? This stuff has gotten really ugly. Um, and so hopefully, you know, uh, like those, those um, parents who are taking kind of the transgender movement into their own hands and trying to fight against it, we'll see more of that with pornography is my hope. One of the weird things I think about modern feminism is it's this odd mix. And we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording. Um, you know, you talked about the, the neoliberal sort of aspect of feminism in terms of sort of work oriented, viewing careerism as the highest achievement that, that a woman can reach uh, and, and the sort of lean in, you know, the cl colloquial pejorative term is girl boss feminism, right? The sort of idea of the female CEO as the, the ideal of, of, of a feminist empowerment. Um, paired with the kind of things that we're talking about, which is this really sort of ugly liberationist um, ideology where uh, it views all constraints as oppressive, including those dictated by basic biological sex, right? That's what transgenderism is about. Um, pornography, certainly, right? The sort of hedonistic uh, immediate gratification, even if it's enormously destructive to, uh, to, to oneself and to one's society. Um, but it's, it seems like do you think there's a little bit of a tension there within modern feminism where you've got the sort of corporatist, uh, serving the market, neoliberal impulse on the one hand, and this sort of radical liberationist impulse on the other hand, sort of melded together into this <laughs> toxic cocktail of, uh, of modern feminism? I mean, is that, do you, do you think those two things work in tandem with one another or are they in tension? Yeah, no, that's a, uh, a really good description of what's out there, you know, kind of the nasty woman um, who, you know, has it. Uh, I actually was <clears throat> on the National Constitution um, Center uh, um, doing doing um, something uh, the other day and the, the feminist um, <clears throat> 1970s feminist kind of professor suffrage uh, suffragist um, uh, expert. She, she wanted to show the whole camera and this is like, you know, she works at UCLA tenured professor and she wanted to show the whole camera, her nasty woman mug. You know, she got it right up into the, into the, <laughs> the view of the camera. Um, so yeah, no, I think there is a way in which, uh, these two things are presented together. Um, and I, I would have to think longer about how they're kind of working off each other. But the thing that becomes most obvious to me is how both of these things are horribly horribly damaging to poor women. Um, because, you know, it's one thing to be a wealthy, you know, um, uh, woman who's, you know, at her Ivy League school or college educated has, you know, daddy and mommy to bail her out when she does kind of libertine things and gets herself pregnant or does other, you know, nasty stuff <laughs> and, um, and can still find a job when she's posted on, you know, Twitter or whatever crazy things. But it's another thing when those kinds of structures um, that, you know, moral structures, political structures that, um, you know, that really shepherd um, all of us through life, right, um, to teach us, you know, how it is that we should um, kind of emulate the good in our life, um, be decent human beings, when those are really, you know, shorn um, 
they're certainly not there for the poor who need them sort of more more than anybody else. Um, so I think that part is particularly destructive to them. The corporatism, you know, certainly where work becomes more important than everything else. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons that's really harmful for for poor, especially single women. I mean, you have a sort of mating, you know, where two two rich professionals are marrying each other, making it very difficult for a single um, income. Um, never mind a single, you know. Uh, income of a of a man who's then supporting a family, but a single mother who's supporting a family and having to work and do the caregiving herself, making it very difficult for her to afford all of life's necessities. I mean, that certainly is difficult. But then, the, kind of the focus on a career when you know w- working class women um, doing wage work uh, are not you know doing kind of flexible high you know high status. Uh, you know, intellectually engaging work, but are punching a clock at Denny's or wherever, and they'd rather be at home with their children. Um, so there's all sorts of ways in which that corporatist um, model is really, really bad, um, bad for the poor. But then, of course, as I mentioned, you know, when you when you start to say like marriage is, you know, just patriarchy and and sex is for sport, um, you really leave those women um, without without you know men to um, accompany them in raising children. And that's what we've seen is massive scale of fatherlessness, especially in um, you know, the lower classes, which is so detrimental to those women who then are raising their children alone, but also to the girls and boys who are you know, in those homes um, without uh, the affections and care of a father. And yet the rich, <laughs> those corporatist women, I mean, think of like a Ruth Bader Ginsburg Think of, uh, well, I was going to say Hillary Clinton, but I don't know about her marriage. But those women who are leaning on their husbands so much of the time um, um, to, you know, to to be able to live their careers lives. Uh, marriage is really at the center of, of a lot of elite life. Um, and so it's a real it's a real um, disaster, I would say, for the poorest women, especially. And that's really one of the main reasons I wrote my book is to really showcase a lot of that that harm for the poor. Have, have you seen any uh, people on the left in particular? You know, it seems to me like, you know, at least the right, if you're just thinking, I guess, of like Democratic Party and Republican Party, you know, the base of the Republican Party is certainly, uh, you know, appears to be probably less educated than the, the base of the Democratic Party, whereas the Democratic Party is really serving more elite constituents. You know, when you're speaking to audiences that are more on the left, are they cognizant of the fact that, you know, the type of feminism or the type of public policy that they're advocating really, you know, in many respects betrays a base that they, you know, would claim as, as Democrats to represent? And you think of the union movement and how, how many union members are probably so far away from the cultural priorities of the Democratic Party. I, do, do people, you know, do the lights go on when you talk about this stuff to a left of center audience? Well, it's <laughs> it's kind of interesting. I mean, the left of center, center audiences that I've spoken with, well, NPR was one of them. And I think I um, really confuse them in um, just uh, like using um, explanations of things that they hadn't really heard a feminist, you know, someone who calls herself a feminist use. So I would say I haven't been invited back there. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's for sure. But I think that that um, that interview went very well from my perspective. You know, there's people like a Robin West who's at Georgetown, who I think really understands all of this quite a bit. She is a pro-choicer. Um, she wrote a really important book called Caring for Justice, um, you know, late in the last century. Um, and, you know, she would call herself a care, uh, a care feminist. I think the care feminists kind of get this the most, Eva Fetter Kitte. But what they tend to do when they understand, um, not so much how, you know, those two women especially would want to put the brakes a bit on the sexual liberationist stance. You know, at least Robin West will say that she says something like, women have a responsibility to their future self not to have sex with a man that they, you know, aren't willing to kind of, you know, be a parent with or whatever. So she she gets um, kind of, sh- I you know, she doesn't speak out really plainly all the time about the sexual liberationist um, position, but I think she would want to put some breaks on it. I think you say, see the same with like a Richard Reeves at Brookings Institution, you know, a, a classical liberal leftist who I think would want to put the breaks on the sexual liberationist movement. But what they tend to do is they have kind of two ways of going about it. One is they just want to kind of, you know, more like, if we could just get the IUD into every poor woman, 
then we wouldn't have to worry about it so much. And so they don't want to like take seriously something like what I'm talking about in terms of sexual self-mastery, especially for men. They just want to kind of band-aid it over. Um, and of course, the IUD comes with it, the whole kind of eugenic background of, of Margaret Sanger, you know, like just make sure the poor can't have kids and we'll all be better. Or they want to just flush in tons and tons and tons of welfare into the system, you know, tons and tons of government support, which, you know, I'm in favor of family policy that robustly supports um, families as kind of a corrective to sort of a libertarian um, uh, uh, kind of angle in our, our perspective in our, in our country. But I think, you know, people, you know, the poor really want good work, dignified work that enables them to care for their families, not just to kind of, and we've seen this, you know, we've seen this recently, like my, my colleague at EPPC, Patrick Brown has shown how, you know, he, as kind of this elite guy, you know, wants to support family policy that gives cash to the poor, but the poor and the working classes really, you know, want to see work being done for that cash. So I think um, those are kind of some interesting uh, tensions that we see um, if we, you know, and, and hopefully, you know, we really, one of the things that I love that American Compass does is really try to try to speak with the poor, try to speak with the working classes. And we've got to do more of that to understand, um, I think, what it is that they um, really need. It's why J.D. Vance, of course, is, is so powerful because of the story, his own story. Erica, unfortunately, we are running out of time, but before we go, we wanted to ask you, and this is the question we ask all of our uh, guests on the show, is what you think conservatism is and how you would define it. Ah, I should have been prepared for this as I've listened to your podcast before. <laughs> um, so that's interesting. I mean, I think, I guess I would say that obviously conservatism has to have at its center sort of an understanding of, of tradition um, and of those things that pass on, um, pass on sort of important kind of key principles for human flourishing. So I guess I would say kind of an, a robust understanding of human nature that we are, um, human beings aren't, re don't really change all that much, even if our circumstances change, our, you know, economic circumstances change, our technology changes, that we really are a certain kind of being uh, that requires certain things to flourish, you know, namely, I think the uh, pursuit of, of virtue and wisdom, um, and that traditions really help us to do that. Um, and so that we really do look to um, to family, to religious tradition, um, to really, you know, rule of law, um, to, you know, small communities of people, because we understand not only, you know, do we require kind of certain structures to help us um, pursue virtue and wisdom, but that we're interdependent beings um, who need each other, need other human beings around them to kind of pursue that, um, that which, you know, brings about both, you know, ha happy uh, personal and societal happiness. So I guess, I, I guess that that would be sort of my, you know, um, uh, quick and dirty on, uh, on conservatism. Uh, great. Well, Erica, thank you so much for joining us today. If people are interested in seeing more of your work or following you, where can they find you? So you can definitely just search up my name, which is difficult to spell, but Bakia, Erica Bakiaki at um, the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and they store all of the things that I've written. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Erica. Thank you so much. For, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to head over to isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age Articles, ISI Books, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI. Mm -hmm.